Let's pray before we open God's word. Father, what a joy it's been to be here with you so far, singing to you, seeing the little kids running around here. What a joy it is to be able to talk to you and pray to you, Father. And now, Lord, what an absolute blessing and honor it is to be able to open your word so freely in this country. God, I, right now, I just I remember brothers and sisters all over the world that have to do this in secrecy. They meet in caves in the middle of the night for fear of persecution. And Father, here we get to come together in a comfortable, air-conditioned room and, and freely read your word. Thank you for that honor, Lord. But as we open your word, Father, we want to hear you speak to us. Your word is truth. Your word is guidance to our feet. Your word is light. So open our ears, open our hearts to receive whatever it is you have from us today. In Jesus' name we ask you. Amen. Amen. All right, if you would open your Bibles or if you have a Bible app on your phone, you can turn that on. And we are going to the book of Colossians, chapter 3, as we're going through our series in the book of Colossians, a series called No Compromise. Colossians is a letter that a guy named Paul, who was an apostle of Jesus, who was in jail for his faith, he wrote a letter to this church. He's never met them before, but he got a word from his good buddy Epi about this church, and um, he felt compelled to write them a letter because Epi was telling him, and I, if you haven't been here in a couple weeks, I call him Epi because it's a guy who, it's either Epaphras or Epaphras. I don't, he'll tell me in heaven, but for right now, he's going by Epi. So he reports to Paul, or doesn't report, he visits Paul in prison, tells him all about his home church in the city of Colossus. He's like, man, this church is amazing. The people there love the Lord so much. Their faith is so strong. Their love for each other is so strong. Their hope for eternal life is so strong. But he tells him, but man, there are things coming against this church pressures from all angles, from within them, from the culture around them, even from false teachers coming into the church, trying to get them to, to maybe blur that line between what it is to live for the Lord and live for the world, trying to get them to maybe not take what Jesus has done for them so seriously. Maybe, maybe you, you can have it both ways. You can have one foot in and one foot out, trying to get them to compromise aspects of their faith. And so Paul writes this letter to urge them, no, gang, do not compromise any of it. Stand strong. And so we're in chapter 3. This is a pivotal part of this letter. Paul's already laid out the truth in the first two chapters. He's laid out the gospel. He's laid out the good news of Jesus Christ. He's told them the foundation of their faith. He's like, you gave your life to Christ. Let me make sure you understand what has happened to you. He's given them the good news. And now he's going to tell them, this is how that plays out in your life. This is what it looks like to live out this good news and this new reality that's come into your life. This is what it looks like to be an uncompromised follower of Jesus. He's like, if you believed in Jesus, have you put your faith and your hope and your trust in him? Have you received his salvation, his death on the cross, his resurrection from the grave? Have you received that into your life? Paul goes, just what we start out with this morning, have you been rescued from the domain of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God's son? Has that happened to you? Do you have a new standing with God where when he looks at you through Christ, you are wholly blameless without a single fault in his eyes? Has that happened to you? He's like, do you have the living God, the spirit of Jesus Christ himself living inside of you? Is that true? Has all the stuff that we've already talked about, has that happened? And if it has happened to you, it's time to start living our lives in consistency with that new reality. That means there are things that we need to start doing that are consistent with what's happened to us, and there's things we need to get rid of that are not consistent with what happened to us. We need to draw that line in the sand, and without compromise, live like this is true in our lives. 
And last week we looked at the first four verses of chapter 3 where he said, we need to get our head in the game. We need to fix our eyes and our minds and everything on these new realities of heaven, on the new realm that we live in, on the things of Christ. We need to get our minds into that. And from where he goes from there, we're going to start at verse 5. We're going to read verses 5 through 11, and then we'll come back and unpack them some. So Colossians chapter 3, starting at verse 5. He says, So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world. But now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free, Christ is all that matters, and he lives in all of us. So again, Paul's going, has this new reality happened to you? Have you been transferred into the kingdom of God? Is all of this true? And if it is, we need to put to death the sinful, earthly things that still lurk within us. So here's what we're going to be talking about today in this section of Colossians, the first filling in your notes. The topic of today is don't compromise with sin. Don't compromise with sin. Don't compromise with it. Don't bargain with it. Don't play around with it. Don't try to tame it or put it in moderation. Paul says, no, find it and kill it. It doesn't belong here. It has no place in this new reality. Put it to death. Actually, the original language that Paul used is more literally translated to say, put to death your members that are on the earth, as in the body parts that are infected with sin. He's probably using the same allegory that Jesus used when he said, look, if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better to go into heaven with only one eye or one hand than to have your whole body thrown into hell. Now, neither Paul nor Jesus were were condoning or promoting physical, like, self-amputation. If that was the case, we'd all be nubs sitting here today. I mean, it is true. (laughs) But even in chapter 2, at the end of chapter 2, Paul says even the most pious self-denial or bodily discipline isn't actually going to address the issue of sin. But what they were trying to stress is the seriousness of sin in our lives and the extreme measures that may need to be taken to deal with them. Well, as I was preparing for this message, I found myself uh, researching and looking into this nasty, infectious condition that was really prevalent during the Civil War called gangrene. I wouldn't recommend researching that over breakfast. Like, you will lose, straight up lose your, your daggone appetite. But it's this, this horrible infection where body tissue is basically dying and dead. Like, the, the skin, the muscle, the, even the bone without blood flow is just pretty much dying. Now, before antibiotics and modern medicine, that's why gangrene had a 43% mortality rate during the Civil War, you basically had two options. If you had a part of your body that was infected with this, you either cut it off or your whole body's going to die. That that was it. If you don't amputate, you're going to die from it. So the point Paul is making here, and the point Jesus made when he used that example is that if you are not actively killing your sin, it will be actively killing you and causing death in and around you. Now, Paul calls out 
some pretty specific sins in this passage. Specific areas of sin by name that he knew this church was struggling with. Apparently his report, old Epi was telling him, these are the things going on in this church. Things that were so common practice all around them in the culture, and even within their church, pressuring them to join in. And Paul was going, don't, don't compromise these things. Th these are all things that take place in the domain of darkness. You don't live there anymore. We're going to keep coming to this because that's Paul's train of thought throughout this letter. You don't live there anymore. You live in the kingdom of light. We need to call these things by their name. There's power in calling sin by its name because the culture isn't going to do that. They're, not, they're going to call it all kinds of other things. Only in the kingdom is it called for what it really is. And we being residents of this kingdom, we need to start calling it as our king calls it and dealing with it the way he sees fit for us to deal with. So the first type of sin that Paul calls out by name is sexual sin, which he labels in multiple levels and different aspects. If you look at verse 5, he, he, he flat out names them sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. This isn't the first letter or the only letter that Paul wrote where when he dealt with the list of sins that a church was struggling with, that this one wasn't at the top of the list. There's two or three other churches that were dealing with this at the top of their list that Paul addresses. Sexual sin may be one of the most deadliest sins there are. Paul told the Corinthians, no other sin so clearly affects the body as this one. He told the Ephesians that this sin shouldn't even be named among them. Not only can it cause some of the most physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual damage and ruin, but it's also one of the most accepted and promoted sins in our culture. All types of sexual attractions and gratifications are normalized, romanticized, celebrated, and even encouraged. But again, look, that is what it is. I'm not, I'm not here to condemn that. That's domain of darkness stuff. I, I don't expect better from that. But Paul's like, but you, are you in the kingdom of light? Then you need to start calling it for what it really is. The Bible only talks about sex in two major ways. The way that God created it and everything else. If you were here a couple weeks ago or maybe months ago at this point, we started a series in stewardship going through the Old Testament. We saw that, look, if God created it, it's his. He owns it. That means he has full right and authority to call it what it is, to define it how it is, to set boundaries that he sees fit on it. It's his. He can do with it whatever he wants to. He's God. And God did create and design sex. And so he has put boundaries and limits on what it is. His definition of sex, how God created and designed sex, is very simple. Sexual desire and gratification was created to be between a husband and a wife. One man, one woman, under the lifelong covenant of marriage before God. Everything outside of that, the Bible calls sexual immorality. Sinful, wicked, wrong. It's cut and dry. God's like, this is what I created for? Now, in this culture, are you kidding me? That's laughable. But we're not in the domain of darkness. They, they can call it what they want. In the kingdom of light, we call it what God calls it. it, it it's his design, one man, one woman, under the covenant of marriage before God, or it's sexual immorality. Now, I did this at the nine. I figure I'll do it here, too. I'm going to deviate from this a little bit. Why did God put that restriction on sex? Why does God limit sex to be exclusively between a husband and a wife? I believe the Bible tells us. If you're in your Bibles in Colossians, flip over to the left a little bit till you get to Philippians. And once you've gotten to Philippians, flip over to the left a little bit more, and you'll get to Ephesians. And when you get to Ephesians, find chapter 5. And in Ephesians chapter 5, Find verses 31 and 32. 
This isn't in your notes, but if you want to, you can make a little reference and write this down in your notes. Ephesians 5, 31 and 32. Why did God make sex exclusive for husbands and wives? Ephesians 5, 31 and 32 says, As the scriptures say, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration of the way Christ and the church are one. See, marriage was created for the same reason everything else in all creation was created, and that is to point to the glory of God. Everything in all of creation was designed by God to point to him. Marriage, the relationship of marriage, the first human relationship God ever made was created to be an illustration to Christ's love with his church. A man and a woman joined together in marriage is to be an illustration of how Christ and his body are joined together. So, Let's think about this. Everything we've already talked about this morning before praise and worship and the beginning of this message, there are exclusive benefits, I don't even mind calling them benefits, to having a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It is only through Christ that our sins are forgiven. It is only through Christ that we have eternal life. It is only through Christ that we are out of the domain of darkness and into the domain of the Son of God. It is only through Christ that the Holy Spirit lives in us. It is only through Christ that we know the joy and the peace and the pleasures of God. That is not available to those who don't have Christ. Well, it's available, but they need to receive Christ to get it. So if something so exclusive to a relationship with God through Jesus Christ exists, then why wouldn't a relationship among people that God designed to illustrate his relationship with us, why shouldn't that have something so exclusive, such joyful and, and pleasure and unifying enjoyment as sex? Because that kind of goodness, that kind of pleasure, that kind of relationship binding is the exact same thing that we have with God through Jesus Christ exclusively. That is why God puts sex as an exclusive thing between a husband and wife. Because only in this marriage covenant do you get that. Only through your covenant with God through Christ do you get the joy and the pleasure and everything else. So if we just go and have sex with whoever... God's going, well, not only is that outside of my limits, but you're smearing the very testimony that marriage was created to have. You're, that's like you saying that, no, my joy and my peace and my eternal life is for anybody no matter what. That's not true. My joy and my peace, my eternal life, all these blessings are for you who are unified with me through Christ. And so the, the, the enjoyment and the pleasure of sex is exclusive to a relationship that mirrors that. Does that make sense? Am I explaining that? I know, it's, it's, it's kind of a, but it makes sense. That's why, it's not because God's mean, but it's his. This is what he chose to do with it. And everything else outside of that is sinful to him. He's like, that's not how I created it. That, that's, it's immoral. It's wrong. Our society doesn't call anything right and wrong anymore. God says it's wrong. We don't live in the domain of darkness. We live in the kingdom of light. So we need to call wrong, wrong as well. Hmm. Hmm. No, I won't go there. Sexual immorality is all about the physical. Whenever the Bible talks about sexual immorality, it's talking about physical. Any physical, sexual gratification that is outside of God's design for it, he calls it immoral. But sexual sin is not limited to just the physical. Paul doesn't stop there. Jesus doesn't stop there. He also lists out impurity and lust in this. Sexual sin that takes place in our hearts and in our minds. And again, he calls them by name impurity, lust, evil desires. Jesus said, if you look at someone with lust in your heart, if you fantasize about them in some sexual way, your heart is just as guilty as if you physically slept with them. 
It, 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 where your eyes and your mind go is just as serious as where your physical body goes. And again, this is the only place you could say that without getting laughed at. Are you kidding me? Like, okay. We, we have stupid sayings, at least these are the ones that I remember from high school. People were like, just because you order doesn't mean you can't keep looking at the menu. Like, cool. <laughs> that, that's so clever. Look, I've, I, know, I know it's funny, and it's okay to laugh. But look, I've talked to girls who flat out say they know their man is looking at other women and even looking at pornographers, and they're like, I'm okay with it as long as he doesn't do anything physically. Like, like it's, that's not a big deal anymore. There's even popular psychology that's, that encourages saying that this is actually healthy for your marriage. You want to spice up your marriage? You want to have a healthier marriage? Then go look at pornography and go do all that. It's good for you. That's domain of darkness stuff. In the kingdom of light, God calls it what it is. That's impurity. That is lust. Amen. There's no place for that in the kingdom. There's no place for pornography in the kingdom of God. And we're going to call that one by name, too. Because when we talk about lust and impurity, yeah, we're going to bring that one up. You know, statistics, statistics are always fun. You want to hear some statistics? You know that 25% of everything typed into a search engine is porn-related? Every single thing that's typed into Google or some search engine, a quarter of it is porn-related. 35% of all internet downloads are porn-related. 43% of all internet users use the internet to look at porn. That's almost half. And these statistics were from 15 years ago. It wouldn't surprise me if this multi-billion dollar ever-growing industry hasn't increased since then. The average age that someone first looks at pornography, you ready for this? The average age the people first look at pornography is 11 years old. Can I get really transparent with you? That's how old I was. I'm sorry I looked at it on your computer. Yeah, yeah. Within the church, 50% of men use and admit to struggling with pornography. And that same thing is true for over 30% of women. Now, I'm not here to talk down in, in a defeating way, but I get passionate about this because this has been my struggle, and I'm just sharing that with you, and I know how damaging it is. It almost killed my marriage. It kills relationships. It kills true intimacy. It kills the way that we look at other people who are created in the image of God. It does nothing but cause destruction and ruin. But if you're within that 30 and 50%, you probably already know that. So there's a couple things I really want to say to you this morning. Number one, by the blood of Jesus Christ, there is forgiveness for every sexual sin you've ever committed. Amen. And every sexual sin that you may commit in the future, God forbid, but if it happens, the blood of Christ will cover it. There is forgiveness for all of it. The second thing I need to say to you is there is victory available over it. There was a time in my life where I did not believe that. I would have told you flat out, no, this is, this is just going to be my thing for the rest of my life. This is going to be the thorn in my side. But I can tell you right now, I'm living in victory of it, and it's available amen. to you. Because look, amen, look, praise the Lord for that. But listen, I say that because that's the kingdom we live in. We're not in the kingdom of darkness where there is no hope and no victory. We're in the kingdom of the Son of God who has victory over every temptation. It's available to us. We can have that victory. God promises that victory to you. Well, do you have control over a thought that you commit? Or do you get control of the effect of that thought? What you said is exactly right. You can't control that. You're exactly right. That thought will come in. What do you do? Oh, we're going to get to that, brother. <laughs> well, I, well, we're going to get to that. But no, you're absolutely right. We can't control every thought that comes into our minds, but we control what we do with them. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, before we get into that, however, I want to let you guys know, if you don't already, we have a ministry here in this church. 
and an awesome group of leaders in this church who serve our church by helping those who struggle with this kind of thing find victory over it. It's our Celebrate Recovery ministry that meets every Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. And we are actually really blessed that we have an opportunity because there is a Celebrate Recovery Summit happening in California this week, and our leaders are flying out there to become better equipped and to grow in being better able to help us get that victory in Christ that is theirs. They're flying out this upcoming Tuesday, and I wanted to call the leaders up to here and have a prayer over them before they go out. Okay. Um, oh, of course Satan's uh, going to be attacking. Exactly. Oh, yeah. So just let you know. The devil doesn't want so people two, getting free from that. two out of the seven. <laughs> two out of the seven leaders. <laughs> Amen. So what we have is obviously myself and Amber are going. Dave Carey's going. Virginia, and I can never say her last name right, so I'm not going to try. That's we right. also have <laughs> sure. yeah, that's Nancy Rickford. And Nancy, Nancy. Nancy's not here. Um, and then we have okay. Jimmy and Kim, who actually attend church elsewhere, but feel very called to serve Amen. Very faithful serving Amen. in our celebrate recovery here. So there's seven of us total going. Keep us in prayer. Amen. Um, because as like as you can tell, Satan's coming in after us. Oh yeah. <laughs> Preach. <laughs> <laughs> um. So. Uh, so. So, <laughs> so being very transparent. Um, you're amazing, by the way. Um, I'm going to this thing, and. I have been avoiding going to this thing for years because I am incredibly selfish with my vacation time. I'm like, four days at Celebrate Recovery or four days at the beach. Okay. <laughs> but God kept putting it on my heart, and I have come across just so much uh, attack um, because Satan doesn't want me to go to this. Mm -hmm. um, and just hearing this message reminds me why I've been in this ministry so f for so many years is because it's changed my life. It's gotten me through things I never thought I could conquer. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go, and I'm going to go out of faith, and I'm hopefully going to bring something back that helps our group get stronger because we have a huge, I mean a ginormous, obnoxious sign on our church that says, Hurts, Habits, and Hangups, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. Let me tell you, it changes lives. Amen. When you get real... You start to heal. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying. So pray for me because Amen. I didn't even want to go, but now I'm happy that I am. Oh. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, Father, I thank you for the Celebrate Recovery Ministry. I thank you for bringing it to our church 19, 20 years ago. I thank you for these people that are going out to this summit, Lord, giving up vacation time and 
making sacrifices for a higher calling, a calling to help others find the true freedom that only comes through you, Jesus. Father, I pray that you would go with them. I pray, God, for their flight. I pray that there wouldn't be complications with that. I pray for anybody who's flying that, like me, has ridiculous flying anxiety. I pray that you would comfort them. And calm. There's two of them. Awesome. <laughs> be with them, Lord. Father, I pray that when they get there, that uh, their minds would stay focused on the calling that you have for them. And Father, whatever they hear, whatever they learn, I pray, Lord, that it would ignite something new in their hearts. Even if it's something that they already know, that it would reignite anew. And they can bring it back with such passion to want to see lives changed, just, uh, just like the testimonies we've already heard of lives being changed. Father, I also know that our enemy is going to be going with them. But I also know, Lord, that he has no control and no victory over anybody who lives in your kingdom. So, Father, may they stand strong in your victory and your strength and overcome every temptation and every obstacle that that enemy tries to throw at them. Nothing, not even the gates of hell, can stop what you're doing, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank, Thank you, guys. So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. Are we, t are we ready to take it that seriously? That it's because of these sins, the wrath of God is coming. In verse 7, you used to do these things when your life was still part of this world, but it's not anymore. Not if you have been transferred into the kingdom of God. But now is the time, verse 8, he's, he starts listing off a few more, and we're not going to spend a ton of time in them. But they're to be taken just as seriously as the sexual sins that we've already talked about says now is the time to get rid of anger and rage that that constant disposition of basically being a walking ticking time bomb where at any moment it'll just blast off amen i used to think i was a calm and patient person until i had kids amen. now i got anger issues but i'm dealing with them through the word of god amen, amen. Now is the time to get rid of malicious behavior and slander. Any word or deed or action intended to harm somebody. It's actually interesting, the, the original Greek language for slander is the same word for blasphemy, which we usually think about as dishonoring the name of God. And what he's saying is when you're slamming somebody else, when you're insulting someone else, you're slamming someone made in the image of God. When you insult them, you're insulting their maker. It doesn't matter who they are and what they've done. Paul's like, there, there's no room for that in the kingdom. That's not how the kingdom operates. It's time to get rid of them. Now it's time to get rid of dirty language. I'm just going to give a moment of silence for the Holy Spirit to do his work on that one. It's time to get rid of lying. Don't lie to each other. 
It's not the way the kingdom operates. Jesus is the truth. His throne is one of truth. Any untruth, any form of lying is just not consistent with this new life, this new reality that we live in. So we need to put them to death. But as my brother asked, how do we do that? How do we go about putting to death these sinful, earthly things that lurk within us? And I think the Bible gives us a lot of strategy for it. These are just four that I kind of grabbed. We're going to call this a biblical, biblical strategy for killing sin. It's going to be the acrostic dead, because that's what we want these sins to be in our lives, dead. Now, this is going to be a personal, daily strategy for you, but this is also taking into account and even taking for granted that you're already doing what Paul's already said in Colossians that you're already making adequate time to be in the Word of God, that you're already making adequate time to be in prayer with God, and that you're already making adequate time to be involved in the body of Christ. Those have to be a given. I'm trying to do these four things without that is not going to work. So if all those things are in place and you're like, yes, this is, this is it, I'm, living the, I'm going for this spiritual maturity in Christ, here's what you can do every single day to make sure that those sins get put to death. And here's the first one. The first D in dead is you need to decide beforehand. Decide beforehand. And what I mean by that is you have to choose to be in the business of killing your sin before the temptation pops its head up. Because you know yourself. You know what you struggle with. You know those areas in your life. And whether they're maybe from the, the, the list that Paul gave in Colossians 3 or any other sin that you're aware of, name the ones that need to die in your life. E either in your notes or in your Bibles, maybe put a little mark or a circle or something around any of these listed that you're like, yes, that's the one. That's the one that, bought, or that's the 12 that I struggle with or that come against me. Name them. And then beside, ahead of time, that you're going to kill them. The Bible says in Joshua 24, 15, choose this day whom you will serve. So in the morning, first thing that when you wake up or before a situation even comes up, here's what I'd encourage you to do. Start going over these truths in Colossians. That's what I've been doing all week. I wake up in the morning, first thing I do is I say, good morning, Lord. Thank you that right now I'm in your kingdom. I'm living in the kingdom of light. Thank you, God, that right now I have a right standing with you, holy, blameless, and faultless in your eyes. Thank you, God, right now that you live inside of me. Now, God, I know the sins that are lurking within me, and I'm deciding right now that when they come, when those temptations come, I am not going to rationalize with them. We're not going to discuss it. I am going to kill them. You have to decide that beforehand, because if you wait until the temptation comes to start thinking about what you're going to do with it, you're done. Because at that point, your feelings are involved in it, your emotions are in it, your sinful desires, they've all come to the table to discuss this with you, and they are very persuasive. And in that moment, you're going to struggle because you're going to be like, if I go through with this, it's going to feel good. Sin feels good until it's over. And as soon as it's over, you're going, how on earth could I have given myself to such short-lived pleasure, and now I'm dealing with all the consequences of it? So no, you need to decide ahead of time. Not, don't wait until they come. Decide ahead of time that you're going to kill them. And when you do that, I love what Proverbs 16.3 says. It says, commit your actions to the Lord, and your plans will succeed. So you say, God, I know what sins are waiting for me. I know what lurks in me. When I see them, I'm committing to you that I'm going to kill them. Next, the E in dead. Eliminate the opportunities. We're going to decide beforehand what we're going to do with them, but we also need to go about eliminating the opportunities for them. Think about your past experiences. And again, in prayer for God's wisdom and clarity in this, determine what situations tend to lead you into this sin. What indulgences, what places, what activities do you participate in that usually lead you 
into this sin. And as best, as thoroughly, as realistically as you can, get rid of them. Avoid them. Some you can't. Some exposure to temptation will be inevitable. We can't hide from all of it. We can't turn it all off. But as realistic and best as possible, do what Romans 13, 14 says, where it says, make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. This also may include people in your life. And I'll be honest, gang, this might be the most important thing I say to you all morning because I know this was a direct revelation from God. What we talked about last week of living out seeking the realities of heaven, seeking the wisdom and understanding of God in everything, in his Bible, in prayer, in the body of Christ. Well, this past week, I was with the body of Christ with that attitude of seeking, and God gave, you know what, Justin, this is what verse 11 means to this message. So if you look in Colossians 3, verse 11, it says, in this new life, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, uncircumcised or circumcised, and so on and so forth. What was happening in this church, this newly formed church, is the same thing that happens in every church. All these people are coming to Christ, and the Jewish believers were all sticking together with the Jewish believers. The Gentile believers were all sticking together with the Gentile believers. All, all, they, they were just circles, circles of people who were comfortable with each other, seeking God together. Now, if you were here a couple weeks ago, we talked about not compromising the church being willing to work and struggle hard and even agonize over growing in our maturity to Christ. In a perfect church, we would all, every one of us, would be gung-ho passionate about doing that. The truth of the matter is we're not. There are some people who are comfortable where they are in Christ and have no desire to go any further. They might not be as passionate about putting these sins to death as you are, and if they're in your circle, it's time to find a new circle. That's going to be painful. But you need to get into fellowship with people that are going to be just as passionate about seeking everything that God has for you as you are. If the other people in your circle aren't, they're going to hold you back. They're going to hinder you from overcoming these sins in your life. Get into fellowship with people that are just as passionate about, yes, we are going to kill that sin. That's why I love our Iron Men's Gathering. We're men there that are ready to kill our sins Amen. and draw closer to the Lord and be sharpened in everything God has for us. So decide beforehand what you're going to do with them. Eliminate the opportunities before they come. Now let's talk about when they do come, because these temptations will. Here's the A in dead. Act fast. Act fast against every temptation. Because you're right, brother, we can't control every thought that comes into our mind or everything that goes past our eyes. But we need to know what to do when they come, and we need to act quick. I'm talking two to five seconds, and I'm not even exaggerating. Within two to five seconds of recognizing that temptation, turn forcefully away from it. Whatever thought is trying to enter your mind, that's going to tell you, hey, think on this. This is going to be good for you. Every image that goes past your eyes, hey, look at this. You're going to enjoy this. Don't compromise with it. Don't rationalize with it. Don't bargain with it. Don't say, well, let, just, just, the, no, no. Act fast and immediately, forcefully turn from that temptation. Turn to the one who rules this kingdom, who's been tempted with everything that you're tempted with and has probably been tempted with exactly what you're being tempted with right then, and ask him for help. I love Hebrews 4, 15, and 16. We sang it this morning. This high priest of ours, Jesus, understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God, there we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Go quickly to the throne of grace. Sometimes you might even need to physically remove yourself from a situation. Go outside. Leave your office for a second. Just take a break. Get, get physically out of the situation you're in. 
You know, sin lurks most when we're in our leisure. Keep your mind active. Keep your body active. Act fast against every temptation. This is something we need to practice doing. Things like outbursts of anger, they always feel like we have no control over them. Like, it seems like all of a sudden just something out of nowhere has flown out of our mouth and we didn't even have time to process it. That's not true, not in the kingdom. We just have to practice recognizing it and turning fast from it. Sometimes it means just covering your mouth and running outside. I'm, I'm that serious about putting this sin to death. Act fast against every temptation. And finally, the last D in dead, drive your mind to Christ. Once you've decided ahead of time what you're going to do with these temptations, you've already made that choice, you've eliminated the opportunities as best you can that will come against you, and then the ones that do come against you, you act fast to turn from them. You can't leave your mind void or vacant or unattended. You need to put something in your mind instead of it. Verse 10 says, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. What we've already read in Colossians, seek the realities of heaven. Think about the things above. Let the message of Christ fill your minds. Drive your mind to the promises of Christ. Remember, you know what you can do? Think about the reason that you even have freedom from sin in the first place. You want to know what image maybe you should start practicing directing your mind to? Think about your Savior, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God, crucified, hanging on a cross, bleeding out for six hours. Let the picture of that fill your mind over whatever else is trying to come in it. Think of his compassion. Think of his kind of, think about how he was asking God to forgive the ones that were, that were crucifying him. That needs to flood our minds. If we want to put our sin to death, this is how we go about doing it. Do you know this God? Do you know the one that bled and died for every sin in your life? Do you know the one that did all of that to transfer you out, to rescue you from that domain of darkness and bring you into his kingdom? His name is Jesus. He died on a cross for every one of your sins, past, present, and future. It is only, only through his death and his resurrection that you are brought into a relationship with God where no matter what you've ever done, God will look at you and say, you are holy and blameless without a fault in my eyes. Do you know him? If you don't know him, he's here today. You can receive him right now. And we're about to end our service with communion. But before we do that, if you're here this morning and you don't know him, you don't know the one who will empower you to overcome every sin in your life, let me introduce you to him. It's just a simple receiving in your heart. There's no special words. There's no hoops you need to jump through. Just in your heart, you can do it. And I would ask everybody, if you would, let's close our eyes, let's bow our heads, let's just be reverent to the people around us. We don't know where anybody in here is. And like I said, you don't have to repeat my words. These are, there's no magic in these words. It's just where your heart is this morning. If you just admit to God from your heart, God, I am a sinner. I recognize these sinful things lurking within me, and I recognize that you call them wrong. And for whatever reason, I feel that right now. I don't want these sins to run my life anymore. I want to turn from them, and I want to turn to you, God. You can just say something to him like, I believe that Jesus died for me. I believe that Jesus rose from the grave for me. And right now, I'm putting my trust and my faith, as best as I even understand that, to receive him into my heart as my Savior, to rescue me from my sins and from the anger of God that is coming. 
God, help me put to death these things that are still within me and help me live my life for you. Forgive me for all I've done against you. Welcome me into, my, into your family. And if you say something like that from your heart, the Bible says you've just been adopted into the family of God. You're made new right now. You've been set free right now. You have been rescued from the domain of darkness, and you are now in the kingdom of God, and you will be forever. And if that's happened to you this morning in your life, and for those of us that it's already happened, but that just excites you that it can happen to anybody who receives it, in Jesus' name, all God's people said what? Amen. Amen. I invite Pastor Bill, come on up. He's going to lead us in communion this morning.